Good morning and welcome to the Youth Suicide and the School Environment webinar. My name is Brandy Brooks and aside from being the moderator this morning, I am a contract manager for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Suicide Prevention Program, the sponsors of the webinar. Before I introduce our presenters, I would like to go over a few housekeeping issues. First, should anyone experience any technical difficulties with either the audio or video for this webinar, please dial 1-800-843-9166. Again, that's 1-800-843-9166. And a ReadyTalk representative will be more than happy to help. Second, all telephone lines are muted except mine and Dr. Berkowitz. So please use the chat function located in the left corner to type in any questions you may have. Given the number of participants, the presenters will do their very best to answer as many questions as possible as we go along and at the end of the webinar during the question and answer period. Now that I've gotten that out of the way, let me introduce our first presenter, Dr. Berkowitz. Dr. Lawrence Berkowitz is the director and co-founder of Riverside Trauma Center. Previously, he directed Riverside Outpatient Center at Wakefield, Massachusetts, a mental health and substance abuse treatment center. A licensed psychologist in Massachusetts, he has specialties in working with children, adolescents, and families. He trains extensively on suicide prevention, assessment, and management of suicide, and postvention activities to contain suicide contagion in schools and communities. Dr. Berkowitz has consulted with numerous schools and communities in Massachusetts on trauma responses and clinical issues for the past 20 years and leads a statewide behavioral health trauma response network. He holds a master's degree in public administration from Western New England College and a doctorate of education in counseling and consulting psychology from Harvard University. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to Dr. Berkowitz. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you for that welcome and good morning to everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Um, it's fun being here this morning. I'm looking forward to having some time with you. And what I'd like to do is just quickly give an overview of what I'm hoping to talk about today and hope that works for you. Please, um, please feel free to you know, type in some comments or questions in the chat box. I'll try to see if I can read and talk at the same time. And my plan is to talk for about 40 minutes and then we have a couple of students who are really excited to hear about in terms of their experiences uh, being high school students in Boston and some of the uh, issues that have come up for them and their observations about the school's attention to mental health and supporting the emotional needs of students. So that should be invaluable. My hope is to talk today a little bit briefly about um, some issues around suicide prevention in schools and then to talk a little more specifically about postvention. When I say postvention, I'm talking about how a school can effectively respond after there's been a suicide death. Uh, that is one of the specialty areas we have here at Riverside Trauma Center is working with communities following, um, uh, following a student death. So hopefully that works for you. And um, let's jump in. But before we do, actually, I'd like to get a little bit of a sense of who we have here. I know I can see lots of names here. It's great to have so many people. I'm going to ask you to take a moment, actually, and just fill out this poll for us. Let's find out who we have here. Um, so if you could just click on this poll, you should be able to respond to it. Um, we should get some idea of who's in our audience today. So let's take just a moment for that. We have just a couple more responses coming in. If you haven't had a chance yet, please click and uh, hit the Submit button on the slide that's on your screen. Great. Thanks. Great. So it looks like we have uh, a number of folks from schools. That's terrific. School nurses, school counselors. You know, the nurses, I'm so glad to see nurses here as well because one of the things, actually I've read somewhere and I certainly hear when I travel to schools, is that 
somewhere on the order of 50% or more of visits to the school nurses have to do with social emotional issues, which I'm sure the nurses could probably affirm and feel free to you know, type something in the uh, uh, chat box if that's your experience too. Great, we have a post-adoption worker for teens here as well. Uh, sorry, it looks like <laughs> we don't have a category for about a third of you. But nice to see that there's some uh, diversity in the folks that we have in terms of your roles. Great, good to see some folks from the colleges too. Thanks. So just quickly, some statistics. What are we dealing with in terms of the scope of the problem on suicide? Is this even an issue we should be dealing with in schools or need to deal with? Well, nationally, we know there's on the order of over 34,000 suicides annually, nationally. Um, it's about 34,500, which one of my colleagues always likes to uh, describe as, if you've ever been to a Red Sox game, think of Fenway Park on a full night. Got a little over 35,000 people there. So imagine that number of people disappearing from our country nationally. It's a staggering statistic. Massachusetts, we have on the order of uh, 500 suicides a year here. Uh, and with youth suicides and the categories, when you look at the national uh, uh, statistics, they, they look at ages 15 to 24 to account for young people. Uh, nationally, last year for which we have statistics is 2007. There were over 4,000 suicide deaths of young people. It is the third leading cause of death for people in the 15 to 24 year old range. Uh, and as you see in the note here on the slide, it's actually second among American Indians who have a specific, uh, uh, markedly higher uh, incidence of suicide. So actually, let me ask you while we're talking about those kinds of statistics, what age group do you think is the highest? Many of you will know this, but as we talk and think about suicides, what age group would you say has the highest rates of suicide? And when I talk about rates, I'm uh, talking about you know, per 100,000. So that's the way we can understand rates and compare one state to another or one age group to another. So let me ask you to take a second, just click on which age group uh, you believe has the highest rates of suicides nationally. Take just a second there for you to click on your little box there and hit the submit button. Next, let's take a quick look at our responses. Yeah, over half of you have said youth. Uh, and you know that's in interesting because that's typically the answer that most people give. Youth suicides gets a, uh, certainly gets an awful lot of attention in the media and in conversations and discussions, as well it should. It's a tragedy whenever a young person is lost to suicide. Interestingly, however, until very recently, I would have told you that elders have the highest rates of suicides. Although uh, what we're finding uh, nationally is just within the last year, middle-aged group, particularly middle-aged men in that 45 to 54 year old range, have become the highest group. We know that elders, actually 75, 85 and older, particularly single white males, have had traditionally the highest rates. Um, and middle-aged folks. So actually, as we're talking today, I'll ask you to be thinking about the fact that suicide prevention is not only helping us deal with the tragedy in terms of young people, it may also be helping us thinking about our coworkers and our colleagues. And here, again, we're looking at just Massachusetts here, statistics from the Department of Public Health. Um, identify for us different age ranges. What's something here that jumps out at you? you'll certainly notice that males have much higher rates of suicide than females. And you're probably all familiar with that. Males have on the rate of four times, uh, four times more likely to die of suicide rate of four to one than females, uh, whereas attempts tends to be on the order of roughly five to one. You can see in that youth range here on this slide that there's about, in Massachusetts, because that's our state, the data I'm most familiar with, there's about uh, 44, 45 deaths in that last year. Um, of young people. So certainly a significant issue we want to be paying attention to. So what are we doing in the schools currently? Certainly if you've got some things going on, feel free to type those in for all of us to see. We'll keep an eye on that chat box as we're going along. But just wanted to talk a little bit about what are some of the social and emotional issues that we're dealing with in general in schools, and what do we know about in terms of suicide prevention work that's going on in schools. You know, certainly for those of you who work with younger children, you're familiar with programs such as um, uh, the, the circle programs and uh, some of the social emotional programs that have been developed for younger children, which are great introductions. And we're starting to 
help children become more literate about talking about emotional experiences, understanding them, and dealing with them. And then in the middle and high school years, we're starting to see more programs introduced uh, to do that deal specifically with suicide prevention. Now, if you look in the Suicide, um, suicide Prevention Resource Center, sbrc.org, they have, if you haven't come across this, something you'll probably want to look at, um, they have a whole best practices registry, which has three levels of um, affirmations of programs, programs that would meet best practice for evidence-based, uh, consensus agreements, and following protocols. But if you look at it, and here, at some point I urge you to do that, and actually here's an updated website. I've got to say I've never seen a www2, but that's the only way to get to this specific one if you type in the, into the URL as an address. Um, there are a number of programs that have reached the level of evidence base. So we're showing, these have shown with research that there are increased um, uh, outcomes that can be looked at in terms of knowledge, most of these programs are looking at identifying risks and warning signs about suicide specifically, and also are looking at uh, risk signs and understanding signs and symptoms of depression. Why depression? Well, it probably seems obvious to you. Um, but the, uh, we know that on the order, from research, on the order of 90 to 95 percent of people who die of suicide across all age ranges have some kind of mental health challenge, some kind of mental illness going on at the time of their death. For youth, it's a slightly smaller number according to some of the research. Um, but we know, and since that's often something that's modifiable, that mental health challenges, mental illnesses respond to treatment, either traditional treatments and or medications, it's something we want to be aware of, identify, and, and try to get young people to get the help that they need for it. But so here's a listing of some of the programs that you'll find in the Best Practices Registry. These are curricula that are out there. They're uh, all very good that are worth looking at. A couple of others that you'll find if you're looking around uh, in Massachusetts. Many people are familiar with the Break Free from Depression uh, um, curriculum and videos that are coming out. Dr. Nadja Riley, who's been at Children's Hospital, has been working at that. She's actually just uh, moving over to the Freeman Center at the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology. Uh, and her work is certainly worth uh, following because of, its, of the rigor in which she's been trying to help young people identify warning signs of depression and speak up about depression. Sources of Strength is another very good program that's also coming up, a promising program that you'll find uh, in another section of the Best Practices Registry. That's more of a peer leadership program, trying to increase um, peer connections and, um, w with each other. If you're looking for programs in your school and, and curricula, the ones that you just saw are certainly recommendations. If you're looking to create your own or have others that you're looking at and trying to assess them, the Best Practices Registry also identifies the American Association on Suicidology's guidelines for school-based prevention programs. So if you look there, this, this is a consensus statement on what are the things that you should be looking at if you're developing a program for your school. Uh, and these are available from the AAS, American Association on so uh, Suicidology, for, uh, I believe for a minimal fee. Their website is suicidology.org, suicidology.org. Um, yeah, I see a couple of notes here. Some people are having trouble getting sound. Hopefully most of you have uh, uh, been able to hear. So please let us know, though, if you're, if you're having trouble. Uh, getting sound. And thank you, Brandy, for helping those people out by giving them the number they might need. So here's one general question, though, however. So we've got a number of curricula that are out there, programs going on in schools, some discussions. You know, there comes the question, though, for many people, maybe you've heard this in your schools or programs you work with, and I've certainly heard it. Are we increasing risk by talking about depression or suicide, specifically about suicide when we're in schools? Um, you know, that's an often held myth that talking about suicide might increase the risk of suicidality. And the question has been asked, some of these programs that we identified, um, the curricula include screening mechanisms. And that question actually has been investigated. Is it safe to conduct screenings in schools? Or is there some risk of what we refer to as iatrogenic um, risks or problems? That means that the intervention where um, the intervention that we're um, uh, conducting, is there some risk inherent to it that we might cause problems by doing it? 
Madeline Gould, who, and some of her colleagues, Madeline Gould is a public health researcher at Columbia University who has spent much of her career looking at issues around suicide, suicide contagion, suicide programs, and if you've had the opportunity to read her work or listen to her talk, you know that she's just a very thorough, competent, and uh, delightful person and researcher. She has conducted some research which was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association a few years ago, in 2005. Uh, where they actually it was a randomized controlled study, so one of the best kinds of studies out there, and it did show us that students did not show evidence of any increased distress, nor increased uh, signs or symptoms of depression or suicidality, uh, and by way of suicidal ideation, following um, screenings. So good thing for us to know. We can feel more comfortable moving forward. There has been some research on that, and if your administrators ask about it or parents raise the question, you can point to some of this research. Actually, why don't I stop just quickly. Um, let me mention this, uh, this um, slide and then we'll go on. So what are the things that we're looking for if we're going to be talking about emotional, mental health, suicide issues in schools? And you know, there's so many issues that we want to try to help our students identify and know of, but I just quickly thought of a few that seem to be recurrent in some of the literature, some of the programs, and some of the conversations I'm hearing in schools. Let me know if these are the things that you're addressing or wanting to address, or maybe there's some others that come to mind for you. So certainly, what are, the aware, what are the signs, the warning signs of mental health challenges and suicidality? So we want students to know this. We want faculty to know it, too. We want all the adults around uh, youth to, to know what are some of the concerns so they can be looking out for them, as well as the students can be looking out for themselves and for each other. Social connectedness, we certainly know that across literature about trauma, we know it about bullying, and certainly about uh, depression and suicidality, that the more connected young people are socially to each other and to important adults in their environment, that the more protected they are against adversity and adverse consequences. And that point about connection to an adult, we certainly know that. You know, one of the, we've seen an interesting um, sort of a, a project that we've done in schools sometimes when we're doing trainings with the faculty, when we're looking at who are the youth that might be at risk in a school to try to pay careful attention to them. Sometimes we'll ask the school to put up giant you know, posters around the cafeteria someday when we have all the faculty together, not just the faculty, but all the staff too, the lunch folks, the custodial folks, um, and list all the students' names. And then we ask all the faculty to and staff to walk around and put a star or a sticker next to the names of students they feel like they know, know well enough to chat with or a student who might come and chat with them sometimes. And then when it's all done, you want to step back and look at it and see who are the students that maybe have no or only one star next to their name. Those are your kids who are flying under the radar, the kids that you need to be concerned about, who are socially isolated and not connected from that powerful protective factor of having an adult in their life that might be someone that they can connect to. We certainly want to talk with youth as part of our programs with them and conversations with them about not keeping secrets. Because let's face it, who are young people most likely to talk to? They're less likely to come to us as adults, right, than they are to talk to each other. Kids know what's going on among kids, whether it's discussed, whether it's on Facebook, whether they're texting each other about it. Uh, and one of the messages we need to give underlying all these programs is if you're worried about yourself or a friend, you can't keep a secret, you need to connect that person or go to a trusted adult to talk to and get help. Increased help seeking is the goal of many of the suicide prevention curricula. And we see that. We hear that after we've helped schools develop programs. That's one of the things I consistently hear. Just last week, I called back a school where we had uh, run a program where they had actually had a suicide death earlier this school year. And we had done some programs in the school. One of the things they told me was that they were getting more referrals from students about them, the students about themselves, as well as about their friends than they'd had in years. And they attributed it to the program they were doing in the school. That's a great thing. <laughs> That's a, um, um, a great sign when you've got kids coming to you saying they're worried about a friend. You know, perhaps you've said this to students too, but sometimes I'm really blunt when I'm talking to kids and say to them, you know, it's better to have a friend who's ticked off at you than who's dead. And students get that. They understand what that means. Although there's such a culture of keeping secrets and not sharing things. If you know, one student says to another, you can't tell anyone this. 
that they often won't. We need to give them permission to speak up. Let me stop there before I jump into postvention for a moment and ask if there's one or two questions uh, that you have. Feel free to type those into the chat section uh, about anything I've said or comment about what you're doing in your school. And then I'd like to do a real quick overview of postvention. Any thoughts or questions there? I'll give it just a minute in case anyone wants to type something in. Okay, well let's move on. Feel free to put, post something if you have a question or a thought or a comment. I do want to talk about postvention. Some of you have heard me talk about this before, my colleague Jim McCauley who I work with here at Riverside. Uh, postvention refers to intervention that's happening after an event, after a suicide in this case. And we might even ask the question, is there a need to do that or why would we do that? I'm going to run very quickly through the, the reasons for that, why we would do that. I'm going to be giving you in about 10 to 15 minutes the overview of some steps to follow. Um, <laughs> although this is typically an hour and a half to two hour presentation, so I'm, I'm sorry I'm giving you the Cliff Notes version. Hopefully if you're interested you'll have the notes here and or have my contact information at the end. I do see one question that um, popped up here. Uh, what age group is okay to start some of these programs such as SOS? How often should the programs be offered in a school year? Great question. Uh, SOS actually has programs for middle schoolers and for high schoolers. Actually, any of you who have that curriculum should know that SOS just produced a new video for their high school version, which is highly improved, much better, I would tell you, than their previous um, um, video. It's just more current, more up to date, and it's taken into account some concerns that schools and clinicians have given them uh, feedback that they've uh, received over time. And um, so those programs are middle school, high school. Lifelines is sort of late middle school, early high school. The work that we've done with postvention in schools, most of the school systems we've been in have said they feel comfortable starting around eighth grade. And that's where we see um, uh, we, we see starting. But it's not too early. You want to, of course, think developmentally. How much information can you give? How much can be absorbed uh, by students? But middle school is not too late to start talking about depression and suicidality. Um, best of younger students, like 10 to 14 year old range, are on a national level we're looking at numbers around 75, which is startling and alarming for that age. In Massachusetts we haven't seen any increase. Uh, there's minimal, thank goodness, deaths in that age range. Uh, but it is a, a growing trend nationally, so an area we do want to start working with kids a little younger. Question about when a teen comes home from a hospital, how to support the student and family. Certainly we know that's a risk time, elevated risk after hospitalizations. Schools should know about it. In fact, we'd ur we urge schools to make sure they have a written policy, maybe in their handbook, about um, how that families are, would be asked to handle their student being in the hospital. You want to be sure that you're involved in the discharge planning meeting if possible. One of the worst things, and we hear about this happening all the time, is a student shows back up after a vacation or something. You don't even know that they've been in a psychiatric hospitalization. You certainly want to know about it so you can help support the student, make sure you have a good safety plan for them in the school, and know who your contacts are, and that, so that you know that you're also talking with their clinician, their treaters. Let me take another quick look, see if there's another question. Oh yeah, same line, along those lines. Um, how, do you not, how do you get parents not to keep secrets about their child's mental health issues? And that's a tough one. Often we hear it, you hear it, parents saying, it's none of the school's business what's going on with my kid or family. Sadly, I think that comes from stigma. You know, parents feeling ashamed or embarrassed, kids feeling ashamed and embarrassed. And as much as possible, we want to put it in our handbooks, talk about it, talk about it at your welcome meetings. When the counselors are introduced at the beginning of the school years, school year, they should talk about it. If, you know, if your child's having challenges, please let us know. We'd like to know how to support you. It's important. We've got your kids six, seven hours a day. See them five days a week, hopefully. Um, you want to give that message that this is a normal part of your role in supporting students in the school. I hope that says a little bit towards those responses. So is there a need for postvention? Deaths happened in a school. Should we do something? Is there 
reasons to do something organized after post-invention? Well, as you might expect, I'm going to tell you, of course there is. We know from some research that there are reasons to do this. David Brent and his colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh have shown in their research that adolescents who have survived the loss of a friend to suicide experience increased rates of depression, complicated grief, post-traumatic stress disorder. That's Brent's studies from the um, early 90s. There has been research that shows us in, talk, in uh, conversations with suicide attempt survivors that over half of those folks said they knew at least one person who had attempted or died of suicide within the previous year in most cases. So some evidence of modeling there. And again, this issue about contagion. And con contagion, we mean the risk that there might be sort of copycats, that one suicide death might lead to increased rates of others. There's been some questions. Is, is this phenomenon something that's real, or is it something that's just perceived? Well, again, Madeline Gould down at Columbia has done some good research. Her research shows that on the order of 2 to 5 percent of young people who die of suicide, can, their deaths can be linked to some other index suicide in the local community, in the close community. And in talking with Dr. Gould, she will acknowledge that there's some limitations to her studies. She's looking at brief periods of time, 6 to 12 months, and her comments are that the numbers are probably higher in terms of contagion. We often see that in schools that we're working with or communities when um, you're seeing whole aging cohorts. Uh, I, we know of several schools where there was a suicide death in the ninth grade, for example, then in that same class, another one the next year, another the year after, following even into college. Exposure to suicide seems to increase the risk of suicide, and there is increasing research to that evidence that people who die of suicide are likely to have been exposed to suicide either at school, the workplace, or in families. So the issue about contagion, not a huge number, thank goodness, but it's real. So um, why are we going to conduct postvention, some organized response if there's been a suicide? Well, some of the ish those reasons are obvious, to try to facilitate healthy grieving, um, to help stabilize the environment. You, any of you who have been in a school where there's been a sudden death or a significant traumatic incident know how destabilizing it is to the school environment. And we want to try to help the schools get back to the business of educating, keeping students feeling safe, focused, and being educated. And we absolutely want to reduce the risk of negative consequences, such as the risk of other suicides. So. There are a number of good postvention models out there. Certainly encourage you to look at some of them. This is a list of a few of them. Maureen Underwood and Karen Dunn Maxim down in New Jersey have been writing about it for a number of years. NAMI New Hampshire, National Alliance for Mental Illness in New Hampshire has got a great program they call Connects, which provides training pre for pre and postvention. Um, I didn't put on here the Lifelines actually has a new program that uh, is available through Hazelton publishing company that has a postvention program. And the 12 steps I'm about to outline very quickly for you uh, will be posted on our website fairly soon. The guiding overall principles when we're talking about suicide with students, we want to be sure that we don't minimize the complexity. Suicide is never about one single issue. It wasn't just because of a humiliating breakup. It wasn't just because they got a low score on their SATs. Um, we need to emphasize that it's usually some form of combination, of coalescing of a number of horrible events in a person's life and or other predisposing factors. We want to avoid romanticizing or glorifying uh, the act of a suicide. And also, as hard as it is, if we're talking with kids about suicide, we want to discourage a focus on the method so often they're asking about the specifics. Oh, I heard it happened this way or that way. And whenever possible, we just want to give some very simple factual information and then really move on to focusing on the person and the loss and what that's about. And of course, we want to have a structure for ongoing suicide prevention efforts. Not immediately after a suicide, but in the months following, we absolutely want to increase suicide prevention in schools. So we would tell you that there's about 12 tasks 
if a suicide should happen, and I'm going to zip through these really quickly, so my apologies and bear with me. But we, first of all, and this is a key, it sounds almost too obvious, but we've seen this ha not happen a few times. We want to verify the fact that the death occurred. We want to verify the facts and find out if indeed it is a suicide. Often the family will confirm that for us. Police might help us. Medical examiner often takes months. Soon there will be rumors. Part of our job is to make sure we have accurate information to try to stem rumors. This is a moment to start coordinating resources, determine if we're just going to use folks from inside the school or outside. Of course, as an outside guest and consultant, I would say to you, I think it's pretty valuable to have outside guests in. Oftentimes, we're able to become to support the people in the school who know the students best and can be meeting with the students. But so often, everyone in the school is impacted by a loss, and it's helpful to have an outside person or two who's got some uh, more objective experience to help support you uh, when you're dealing with a sudden loss in a school. Best, of course, if you have a plan in advance, if your crisis team has a plan, some policies in place, and you've got existing relationships. One of the things we certainly encourage you to do is make sure you've got some good working relationships with the local mental health centers and resources so that if you're having an emergency, people can step in. I should let you know if you're listening from Massachusetts, actually, that our services at the Riverside Trauma Center are funded by the Department of Public Health and the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health, and we're available to provide assistance to the schools throughout the state. Disseminating accurate information. We mentioned that, you know, it goes with number one here is make sure you've got the facts, put them in writing, make sure that you're, what you're writing offers condolences and talks about the plans that are going to be happening, what your school will be doing to provide support to students. Parents want to know that. They want to know what you're doing. If you know what the funeral plans are or if there are going to be changes in schedule, um, we want to be sure to communicate that and avoid giving this kind of information in assemblies. Much better to, um, much better for people to get this information to students in small groups. That way you can judge their reactions and respond to specific needs. If you're in an assembly with two or three hundred students, you can't see who's having a difficult reaction and who needs a little more attention. You say for math schools, there's a question here, who's a contact to be in touch with? Um, at the end of this, you'll see my, my um, email addresses here and our website, and you're certainly free to contact us if you need support or extra information about post pensions. Next, we're going to say to you, support those who are most impacted by a death. You know this if it's happened in your school. You want to think about who are the young people who are most impacted. Sometimes it's not obvious. Um, it might be administrative staff coaches, other people who have been close to the students. But we often like to think about who are individuals who are at risk, particularly after a suicide. Who are the people who are going to be most distressed or have elevated risk themselves? If we think about these concentric circles here with the person who died in the center, the people at most, in most need, of course, are going to be other vulnerable students, kids who have been depressed, those students who have come back from the hospital recently, you know, a girlfriend or a boyfriend, or a recently broken up girlfriend or boyfriend, siblings, um, and then moving out. Who are other kids in the classes, other students who might have trouble kind of getting it. We've learned to ask schools to pay attention to the kids who have Asperger's who might not really understand the death and might need some social skills training on how to respond to other students and how to talk about it. So continuing to identify those who are at most risk, other kids who might identify with the person who just died. Providing opportunities for commemoration. A lot of questions. I can't certainly go into it because it would take so much time here to talk about memorials. Um, but we need to have a possibility and a place to talk about it. If there's going to be commemoration, it should be outside the school. Sometimes um, spontaneous memorials pop up if that's going to happen. If you want, it's a good idea to have a place where students can draw, write poetry, write their comments. But don't put that in the front hall or in the cafeteria where people have to look at it. Let students opt in as to whether or not they want to see it and be part of that. 
you want to put that in a part of the school where it can be up on the walls for a few days, and then let them know there's a plan. By Friday, we're going to take this down and give it to the family. Let them know what the specifics are about that. We want to be sure we're providing some psychoeducation, both about grief, because for many students, this might be the first time they've been exposed to a loss that's that close to them, and about suicide. Here's the moment to start doing some education. And to, you know, one of the ways we can even talk about it is to tell students we're so sorry that their friend died. We're so sorry that they've had this loss. And what a tragedy it is, because their friend was a great person. And the biggest tragedy was their friend didn't know that he or she could have gotten help. And that's where we start a conversation about making sure we're watching out for other people, that we as a school or a community should commit to trying to make sure this never happens again if we can, and that everyone knows what the resources are and how to get help. These are the moments to really talk about coping strategies around the grief, but encouraging also coping strategies for dealing with depression or challenges. Case finding, we often do this. I, you know, I would be glad to talk with people a little bit more at length. Sometimes after one suicide, if there's been more than one in the community, we absolutely encourage doing some kind of screening, but that, that should be supported and you need to find a tool that is reliable and valid and that you can feel good about. But case finding helps us look for after there's been a suicide death and there's already a little bit of risk in the community there, an increased risk, who are the kids who might be at some increased risk? You know, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey results in Massachusetts and nationally tell us that on the order of 8 to 10 percent of students report they've seriously thought about suicide. This is at the high school level. Um, we want to find out a little bit more about who those students are and make sure we're paying attention to them and getting them connected with adults. If there's been more than one suicide in the school, we absolutely want to start thinking about this as a trauma response. And there are good, um, good programs and plans, some evidence-based out there for helping young people as well as adults start to deal with their experience of this from a perspective of trauma in addition to dealing with the grief. And then really focus on trying to help people understand self-care and looking at taking care of themselves and developing plans, specific plans for how they're going to be taking care of them, their own emotional needs and those of their peers going forward. We want to be sure we have a good list of resources. Are there local mental health resources? Can we develop a list of websites, hotlines, local clinics so that we have these available to give to students? So they might look up information for our older students to make sure parents have this, uh, so that parents can be finding help and support for themselves or their children if they need it. And of course, any time we've done any kind of response like this, there should always be a, in the, in the trauma response field, it's referred to as a, a hot wash at the end. You want to sit down and do a debrief for the team. What worked? What didn't work? What's our plan? Are we going to revise our crisis plan for anything that happens in the future? This allows some time for planning, too. Do we know when that student's birthday is coming up? Um, do we have to pay attention to issues like the junior prom or graduation? How about the one-year anniversary of the student's death? These are all parts of the post-pension planning process. And finally, particularly if there's been more than one suicide, we want to develop a community-wide prevention plan. Part of the message here is it's not just the school's responsibility. How often do we see this, that when difficult things are happening in a community, that everyone focuses on the school? Part of the message here is it's a community. It's the village's responsibility to take care of the children in the community. So we might talk at this point in time about developing a coalition, a task force, really looking at what are curricula to in include in the schools, but what else can a community do in terms of educating all the members of the community about risk factors, and about protective factors. You know, as we've gone around the state in working with students, particularly after there have been deaths, we keep hearing from the students that they believe this should be part of the regular curriculum. We've had kids tell us it should be, you know, just like a health class, just like a phys ed unit, like, you know, what 
they learn about sexual assault, fitness, all the other health issues that are included in schools, anything from washing hands and um, you know, wearing seat belts and bicycle safety all the way up to how do you protect your friends' lives and your own. So let me take a very brief um, break here, ask if you have any questions you'd like to type in, because in just a moment or two we want to be sure to turn this over to our students. I know that I've rushed through a lot of information here, but I really just wanted to whet your appetite, give you a little bit of information. Um, one resource here is a lot of the, the 12 steps I've just talked about in postvention are available in this reference that's here. Another very important reference that you should know about that was just released in April, what is called After a Suicide, a Toolkit for Schools. This was developed by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and the National Suicide Prevention Resource Center. It's available on both their websites. And this um, web address that I've just put up is uh, one where you can find that. This is a very handy, almost cookbook approach if, you know, heaven forbid, you've had a death in your community by, in your school uh, by suicide. You can read through this. I would certainly encourage you to look at it beforehand. Um, and they provide very good resources and steps and suggestions on how to manage uh, a sudden death like that. As I mentioned to you too, our hope is in the next week we will have the 12 steps that I just talked about posted on our website as well. And I'm going to put up um, I'm going to put up the um, contact information in just a second. Hey, Brandy, there's a question here asking if the, um, the PowerPoints will be emailed or available to people. How, how could people best access that? Could you comment on that, Brandy? Yes, I can, Larry. So at the conclusion of this webinar, um, once we finish, I will be emailing all participants a link to the podcast as we do record our webinars, as well as any information provided by the presenters, so the slides from the presentation as well. Excellent. Thanks. Any thoughts, reactions, questions? Well, I'm going to put up my contact information here, so feel free to, you know, get in contact with me about other questions. Our website's up here. As I said, my hope is in the next week we will have a little bit more uh, of an outline of the 12 steps you just saw here available on our website. And again, if unfortunately you're in need and you're in Massachusetts or other states, we're happy to help as well. But in Massachusetts, it's uh, part of our covered by our contract. We're glad to give support and help if you should need that. Um, but Let's turn now. Let's take a minute to turn to. We have two students with us, which is a great opportunity. And uh, Brandy, would you like to introduce them? And uh, we're looking forward to hearing from our students about their thoughts. Thank you so much, Dr. Berkowitz, for providing the framework for the rest of our discussion this morning. Um, as Dr. Berkowitz said, I do have two student speakers that will be talking this morning. I will introduce the first of our two speakers and then turn it over to her. Um, the first of our two speakers is Rachel Corbett. She is a senior at City on the Hill Public Charter School located in Roxbury, Massachusetts. For her city project topic, she is focusing on domestic violence, um, specifically the role of gender in violence, perpetration, and victimization. Um, Rachel hopes and works towards creating a world without sorrow and violence. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to Rachel. Thank you, Brandy. Again, my name is Rachel Corbett, and I'm 17 years old. I go to City on a Hill, and I plan to attend UMass Dartmouth in the fall. Today, I'm going to be focusing on promoting mental health awareness in schools, do I believe there is enough mental health awareness, and how I would improve the amount of awareness, along with my school's way of dealing with this topic. Um, the first question I'll be focusing on is, how good is your school at promoting mental health awareness? Um, my school, I go, like I said previously, I attend City on a Hill, which is actually a very small school. There's about 300 students in total. Um, my school is very open to talk about personal issues. Um, my school, we all know our teachers well enough, and they know us well enough as well um, to talk about any issues that we have. It's like an open door policy. So we could enter the teacher's classroom at any time if we need to talk. Um, along with that, in every classroom there's a sticker or a poster that says this room is a safe space. So um, you can, in fact, talk to the teachers about anything. We also have a guidance counselor. Um, 
that is very willing to talk to us, but as well as, um, in some cases, that's kind of forcing the student to reach out to the teacher compared to, um, instead of it actually being the teacher going to the student when they see that something is wrong. Um, also, bullying is not tolerated in our school at all. They are very strict on no horseplay, no name calling. So if something does actually occur, um, someone, the bully is actually sent to the dean. But what I've noticed in the past is that once the student is sent to the dean, they never really focus on the victim. Like, they never talk to the student afterwards to ask, like, are you okay, what happened, like, to sit down and talk. They just focus on um, basically disciplining the bully um, to make sure it does not happen again. My school, we have service days, and the service days are when you are either going outside and you're either cleaning up the streets or along the lines of that, or also you stay inside and you learn about the issues um, of drug abuse and how that does affect a family, mental health awareness, sexual health um, awareness. Uh, also, the freshmen have a mandatory health class that they must attend, and they focus a lot on basically how to have healthy relationships growing up. So to make sure that like you catch the issue before it occurs. Um, like Brady said, for my city project, um, I worked at Girls Leap, which is a self-defense program. Um, they teach girls ages 8 to 18 mental and physical self-defense. So I actually have a strong background in that area. Um, in it basically is making sure that the girl knows that she's worth it. Make sure that she can defend herself, using her voice, asking for help. Um, and I feel like that does connect to the school a lot because what people don't know is that when they hear domestic violence, they think of domestic just being in the home. And no one actually takes a step back and says, well, she is a victim of domestic violence. How does this affect her in school? How does it affect the community? And this also is kind of similar to suicide because if someone is dealing with depression, they're just saying like, oh, it's that person's problem, it's that family's problem. But what they don't understand is that it also affects the community overall. So I feel like um, my school in general does help students a lot with dealing with depression. Um, my sophomore year, I lost my grandfather to cancer and I went through a, basically a phase of depression. A lot of my teachers, they realized this and they placed me in a girls group program. Um, and I've been in that program basically since sophomore year. At first I was kind of iffy about reaching out for help because I didn't want anyone to make fun of me. And I feel like that is a huge issue in schools with teens is reaching out and asking for help is a sign of weakness. But what I've learned is that it's not. And most students aren't educated on the fact of reaching out for help is not weakness. It's actually strength in yourself to say, I need help with something. Um, in this girls group, I learned that it was just myself, um, a few other girls who were going through a very similar issue, and a guidance counselor. And we talked about ways that we could help each other to make sure that we're not being depressed, we're not feeling a sense of self-anger. Um, just to basically improve our overall mental health. And I feel like my school has come a very long way with improving, excuse me, my school has come a long way with improvement of awareness in my school. Um, we actually had, a few weeks ago, the Gay Straight Alliance, they stood up at my school town meeting and they spoke about how bullying a person does lead to death in most cases. Um, and how words do basically impact a person more than you would imagine. Um, the next question that I'll be answering is, do I believe there's enough awareness? And I kind of touched on this. Um, I feel like to an extent there is enough awareness in my school that goes on. Like I said about how all the classrooms are open door policy, you're willing, um, the teachers are willing to talk to you, but I feel like um, that teachers need to reach out more to students compared to students reaching out to teachers. Um, once a teacher realizes that something is happening with the student, that they're not acting the same, that's the point when they should, in fact, reach out to that student instead of waiting for the student to come to them. Because I feel like that's where a lot of teachers go wrong is when they don't reach out when they first see it. 
the second question, or actually the third question is, what would you like to improve about the awareness of mental health in my school? Uh, let me see. Sorry. Um, okay, so what I would like to improve basically in my school is overall, it's kind of all the same thing, like having teachers reach out to students um, and also having more knowledge about the issue because during service days and during freshman health class, we all talk about ways to be mentally stable for yourself and how to have a healthy relationship with someone. But yet, we never really actually touch on the topic of suicide. We never touch on the topic of, for example, like domestic violence and how that impacts the community. Um, I feel like we need to focus in more on the issue of suicide and maybe have like posters around the school and also um, have more student-led groups where seniors teach back to freshmen about how even though your school workload is hard and you still have issues at home, it's okay to talk about it. Because that's the best thing when you're in high school is to talk about your issues. Keeping them inside isn't going to help you in the long run. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can ask them now. Does anyone, if anyone has any questions specifically for Rachel, you can type them in now. Um, and she will answer them once they come up. So I'll just wait a moment in case anyone has any questions. If not, we'll move on to our second student speaker, Cabria Lindsay. Rachel, I just want to say thank you. This is Larry again. Uh, I think that was great hearing from you. And you touched on a few really important issues like bullying. And we certainly know nationally, as well as in Massachusetts, bullying has gotten so much attention lately. And in terms of suicide and bullying, we do know that uh, kids who are bullied are at increased risk of suicide. What's interesting is the finding also that kids who bully are at increased risk of suicide. And those who were bullied and become bullies have even higher risk of suicide according to one study. So certainly something we want to be paying attention to from both ends. And good point you made that the victims often need the emotional support and attention too. I'm glad also you mentioned the GLBT, gay, lesbian, bi, and transgender issues. Some terrific studies for those of you who are interested. You can find uh, important monographs available on the uh, SPRC website um, that show us that uh, youth who identify as GLBT or questioning have on the order of a four times increased suicidal behavior, so ideation and thoughts and attempts over folks who are not dealing with those issues. And, and this research, which will sound like common sense to you, tells us that families where the families are not accepting of their child's uh, identity as gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender have on the order of an eight times increased likelihood of suicide. So very important issues. I'm glad you mentioned those. Those are you know, things that we in schools need to be paying attention to. Thank you. Question about any statistics on adopted youth. Adopted youth and suicide? Interesting question. Uh, it's something I have not seen. Um, has anybody else in our audience seen any research on that? I see some people out there like uh, Janice Ventry. I know you're familiar with some of the research. Or Maura, any, anybody else out there know about studies on adoption and suicide? Um, Larry, I don't know about specific studies, but I do know here in Massachusetts, one of our grants that we received from SAMHSA, uh, we thought that the um, the youth that are in custody, DCF, Department of Children and Family Services, and DYS, Department of Youth Services, we did see that they were at increased risk for suicidality, depression, and some other things. So they weren't necessarily adopted youth, but they were youth um, in custody, um, either you know family members in care and things like that. So I don't know if that answers your question that came up, but. Um, that is some of the things that we are seeing. That I, I can't point to any specific study right now, but if um, the participant is interested in more information, I could certainly get in contact with them after the presentation and send what we have. Sounds good. Thanks, Brandon. Okay, right, so well, if, move on. if, uh, if uh, other questions pop up, we can get back to them. 
Okay. All right. So I will now present our, or introduce rather, our second student speaker. Um, as I mentioned before, our second student speaker is Cabria Lindsay. Uh, Cabria is also a senior at City on a Hill uh, Charter School located in Roxbury, Massachusetts. For her city project topic, she is focusing on suicide prevention, specifically the roles that schools can play in supporting suicide prevention and intervention. As such, Cabria reached out to the Department of Public Health and has been serving as an intern to the Suicide Prevention Program for the past several months. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to Cabria. Thank you, Brandy. As she has stated, my name is Cabria Lindsay and I am currently a senior at City on the Hill. I am 17 years old and I plan on joining Birmingham State University in the fall. I will be talking about the personal experiences I have had with suicide and how both teachers and students can help alleviate the pain within the school environment. <clears throat> I've had many friends who have contemplated suicide, and there are many factors that have contributed to this. It may be stress within the home or within the school environment, depression also within the school or within the home, and basically as teenagers, our hormones also have a big um, effect on how we feel. Many people may feel as though teenagers, since we're going through this stage of becoming a teenager to an adult, that these are just phases that we go through and that we'll eventually overcome. But there are many um, other things that, you know, can add on to that and really um, have us think about this sort of suicidal thought or whatever, which may, you know, need some attention. <clears throat> and sometimes it's really hard to reach out. For example, at my school, there's 300 students, but only one guidance counselor. And still, with such a small amount of students within the school, it's still not enough attention for us because as this one guidance counselor is helping out these 300 other students, the attention that we may need is not the amount of attention that the guidance counselor can give us because she has to worry about every single student in the school. And sometimes it's hard because, you know, many um, teenagers do not like to reach out to their parents because they have the factor of they don't want their parents to worry about them too much and how they want to make sure that their parents can, you know, focus on the whole family instead of, like, worrying about their child, thinking of this certain type of way and having to worry about that. So they sort of hold it away and bottle up these feelings when the best thing they need to do is actually talk to somebody but without the resources and the people around them, it's much harder to do so. <clears throat> what people can do within the school environment and outside of the school environment is listen. Because as a teenager, and if we're feeling some sort of way, what we'd like somebody to do is to listen to us. Because instead of giving advice, especially if you don't really know about the problem or what they're going through, what the teenager would like to do is have somebody listen to them because when there's a suicidal thought or some sort of depression, the main factor is that they feel as though they have no one to talk to. And by having that helping hand, that person who has all um, eyes and ears that's ready to listen to them and what they have to say, that's one step into helping the suicide prevention process go. Because as they have more people to talk to um, and more resources, they know that it's safe and that people are actually there caring and listening to them, um, understanding what they're going through and also trying to help them overcome that barrier that they have. And um, <clears throat> within my school, although um, there's only one guidance counselor, we do have many teachers that are there that are willing to listen to us, like Rachel had stated in her presentation. And through that, it is also very helpful because um, having those teachers there it shows, like, you have a family. And within my school, it's very close-knit. So it's like you can talk to any teacher, even any teacher that you really haven't had a connection with within your four years in that school or however long you've been in that school. Um, any teacher is willing to listen to you. And it's, that's really what you need. You need somebody who's going to show you that they care about what's going on with you and try to help you overcome that. And... Um, <clears throat> Imagine going to a district school where there's about 1,000 to maybe 3,000 kids and having only one guidance counselor. How much harder that could be on the students themselves because um, 
say if you're going to your guidance counselor and there's many other children that's in there, um, many other students in there feeling the same way, and you don't have that sort of connection with your guidance counselor, you don't have that type of connection with your teachers, and then you go home and you have that same kind of negligence with um, the listening and like the attention that you need, it's much harder on you. So I'm sort of thankful for having a smaller school to be able to go to because I have that connection. But some other kids aren't as lucky. But you know, sometimes you still do need that listening ear for you. So you know, within schools, what what you need, maybe you need more guidance counselors for like bigger schools because although my school is small and we still have one guidance counselor, that's still not enough. So um, when I think about the ideal world surrounding um, mental health within my school, in any other school, I think about having more guidance counselors. And also, um, um, I think about having more like programs or like a class that has to do more with mental health. Because although we do have the, um, the freshman health class, when I first entered City on the Hill, that class didn't exist. So my school is doing a good job at improving with getting the mental health um, aspect into the school environment. But that's only for the freshmen. And there's three other years before that, have, that haven't had that experience. So therefore, I feel as though my school needs to have more programs such as the health class, but for every level of um, the students that are there. <clears throat> also, it can be a very stressful environment, especially with my school that, has, that holds really high standards since we're a charter school, that there should be you know, self-evaluations at the end of class. And thinking about it such as, how did, this, how did you feel within this class? Do you feel that you'll be able to, you know, do the homework without stress, and like if you have like any problems, like you know, we're there to help you. You know, you can always email us. There's always a question. Like having that availability, and then also thinking about it yourself. Like, okay, during this class, I got really stressed out, knowing that there was so much that I needed to have done. What can I do about it? Who can I talk to? How can I make this um, task not as hard as it seems to be thrown at me? And by having like say study groups and everything, like. Um, not only could it be a study group, but it could be like a support group. You have the group that's there, you know, to help you overcome the work, and then at the same time you have the group to be there to, you know, if you're feeling stressful about like a big test that's going on, that they're there to, you know, help you out. And within the support group can also be a teacher, a faculty member, whatever the case may be, but you also have that adult aspect around it that's really helping you out to make sure that you are mentally stable and able to live a healthy life. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much, Cabria, um, for your comments. Um, Larry, I don't know if you have anything to piggyback off of that. Sure. I'd like to say thank you also, Cabria. And actually, why don't we you know, encourage people, if you have thoughts or questions, to be writing these while I'm just speaking a little bit here. You know, again, Cabria, I, I love the wisdom of our high school students. You, you mentioned so many important things there, but the one that really stood out for me is your request that people listen more. I think when we're around young people, our tendency as adults is to talk. And we probably do better to listen more and let them know that we're there to listen and pay attention. Uh, great ideas about making sure there's small groups, study groups, support groups, places where students can get to know the adults around them and have opportunities to meet and talk. Where are other places that that happens? That can happen with coaches. You know. Uh, club advisors, lots of those places we want to build in as much as possible room for that important protective factor, having an important adult in their lives. You know, I was thinking also as you were talking, Cabria, there's uh, someone who's done some writing, this guy, John Califat, who's talked about building competent communities. And that's a lot of what we're doing in our schools, is trying to figure out what are all the pieces that help people in the schools know that they can speak up, know that they're attended to, learn problem-solving schools, for example. I heard at the uh, Massachusetts State Conference on Suicide Prevention that just happened last week, uh, there was some conversation. I haven't seen this in the literature, but I, there was conversation about it. And I'd like to see if there's research to back it up about the, what the, somebody was claiming was that uh, oftentimes the uh, stu younger students who we see who've died of suicide, often those are the students who look particularly complicated competent, we're doing lots of activities, the ones that people are surprised. Boy, they didn't seem to have a lot going on. Um, but often these are the 
kids who are so driven and so successful, but the one thing they haven't quite learned is how to problem solve and how to manage their stress, how to ask for help when they need it. I think that gets to the whole stigma issue that both of our students here today talked about. Have, are you comfortable asking for help? Is that a shameful thing to ask for help? And, and we do want to be giving the message that that's what competent communities do. We support each other. We give help. We ask for help. Other thoughts for our students, uh, our student speakers, about their experience in schools and what they would find helpful in schools? Um, actually, Larry, while we're waiting for some questions, um, Rachel would just like to piggyback off of some comments that Cabria made and also you made and just share a little bit more about her own personal experiences in school. Great. Hi, again, my name is Rachel Corbett. Um, I am 17. So throughout my whole education experience, um, I basically grew up, I went to a very small school, 6th and 7th grade on Thompson's Island, but that closed my seventh grade and I had to transfer. Um, and I ended up going to Upham's Corner Charter School, which was a predominantly minority school, and I was the only white student there. Um, and I felt actually kind of out of place and left out, and no one was actually ever willing to talk to me about it. Um, I was bullied a lot. There was a point where I was actually chased down the hall with the knife, and it came to the extremes where no one ever brought it up after it happened again. Um, and I feel like throughout my whole education, um, I never really tended to rely on teachers because they never reached out to me. And it was hard for me to connect to my teachers because most of them were older than me. They didn't know what I was going through. Um, and I was just automatically judged because I was the new girl. Then when I switched, when I graduated from eighth grade and went into high school um, at City on a Hill, it was basically a lot of the kids that I went to eighth grade with had traveled to the same high school as me. Um, and I had some fear going into that, um, thinking that it was all going to happen again, that I was going to be left out, no one was going to like me. Um, and I still, I am the only white girl in my school, um, and at this point, it doesn't really affect me. Um, I don't really see it as an issue, but going into it, I was very scared because a lot of the kids had traveled from the same middle school as me, and yeah, but the school, like I said, they don't tolerate bullying at all. Um, so a mediator was put in place my freshman year, and we all talked it out, and we realized that we just need to get over it. We need to grow up and move on. Um, and that was very helpful to have someone actually stop the situation from occurring. Um, and now we're all friends. We all talk. Um, in some cases, my school is very small, so we're kind of forced to be friends. But we've made it through all four years, and now everyone is family. We all love each other. We're there to talk. But just knowing that in eighth grade I was so young and I was being a victim of in-school bullying and I couldn't talk to my mom about it um, and no one was just there for me to talk to so I basically kept all this inside from eighth grade to basically the middle of ninth grade so um, I feel like teachers need to step in a lot more to help students out um, if they do transfer if they are new um, and also, that kind of touches on how my ideal school would be. Um, overall, my ideal school would be, like Cabria said, um, more guidance counselors. And also, kind of how she said, um, a class that is in place for all grade levels, basically focusing on the issue of suicide and mental health, and basically just a time to relax for yourself, to talk about any issues you have, um, to ask questions about um, personal experiences, um, to try to relate to the other students in your school. Because that would be helpful to know that you're not alone. Because um, most students, when they do go through depression or have thoughts of suicide, they believe that they're alone. And once they start reaching out and they ask questions, they realize that they're not alone. And it helps a lot more when you can connect to someone um, in a situation. So, yeah, that's basically it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you again for our two speakers. Um, 
does anyone have any questions? If you do, please use the chat function. I'll wait a few minutes um, to see if anyone has any questions. Um, Larry, I don't know if you have any comments after um, Rachel's comments just a few seconds ago. Yeah, well, thanks for the important reminding us of the importance to really pay attention to the needs of kids who are being bullied. And I really like Rachel, what you told us about the how the um, you know, getting kids together and helping them talk and learn from each other often helps resolve problems. And I love the fact that you pointed out that you ended up becoming friends with kids who you were having problems with. What a uh, what a great outcome to that. I'm going to ask a little more specifically, if I may, Brandy, a question before I mention one other thing. The mm -hmm. question that well, I'd like to put to the audience, you've got a lot of experience out there. I always like to hear from people who are in schools what you're seeing, what's working. What's working in schools? What are you doing? What do you feel is working? Do you have curricula that you um, are doing? Um, and certainly we need to get uh, Cabria to talk to the funders in the Department of Education to let them know we need more guidance counselors. That would be great. <laughs> but in, in the absence of that, what, what's going on now? What do you think is working well in your schools? So let me ask you just to type a couple of examples to that. And I also wanted to mention one thing we haven't mentioned here yet is the role of um, social networking and media. Um, we could talk a lot about the negative effects of media, but we also know that that's w one of the most significant ways in which young people are communicating now. Uh, and there's some growing use of Facebook and other social media for prevention efforts. We're actually starting to see the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and Talk Lines, um, which are call-in hotlines around the country, are starting to experiment with using um, texting, instant messaging and, and texting in their lines. Because we know that most people under the age of 25 who have phones spend more time typing into them than talking into them. Uh, so there's some uh, experiments going on right now, some beta testing of using uh, text and instant messaging, which are looking quite promising. They're increased use of, by younger people, uh, which is really important and promising. We're looking forward to that. Some very cool uh, developments with Google and Facebook. If you Google right now the word suicide or type into a Google search, I want to kill myself, or something similar, of the 1.5 million or whatever results that pop up, the first one now that Google has put into their logarithms will be the number for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, the hotline. So they're trying to help get some prevention out to people, a way of reaching out. And interestingly too, if there is some bullying or concerning messages going on on Facebook, Facebook has actually become committed to trying to deal with that. If someone puts a post on Facebook that indicates they might be thinking of suicide, there is, and, and I can get this to people if you're interested, there are links to get through to people at the administration of Facebook who will then try to track down where that's coming from, that post is coming from, and actually get in touch with the local suicide prevention hotlines in those areas to make contact with the person who posted it. So that's pretty exciting. We in schools need to be talking with students about what's going on online. I know you're doing that in terms of the bullying, but in terms of monitoring how kids are doing their mental in terms of their mental health, we should probably be including in our conversation some instruction on what to be looking for in terms of warning signs, even online, and telling students what they can do about it, which might mean coming to talk to us, their counselors, their nurses, their teachers, their parents, some trusted adult. And then, if need be, we can help people um, contact some of the social media for help. We're actually starting to look into ways to use uh, social media as part of post pensions. We've just completed a second, of, um, a second uh, focus group, actually, with students who this group was actually in, currently in a high school. Another group were students who recently graduated. Both groups were from schools where there had been suicides in the schools. And we've been asking students to help us better understand how they use Facebook after someone's died. Either memorial pages are going on to that person who's died's Facebook page. And we're trying to learn from them what would be helpful and useful for them in terms of when they see concerning posts. We're trying to have conversations with them about how they look out for each other, how you keep your friends back. Um, 
So that seems to be sort of the new, one of the newest areas, that, and we're trying to get involved in that and always looking for feedback uh, from young people as well as adults on how to best use social media in terms of prevention. So any other thoughts, questions, comments about what you're doing, what you find works, curricula that you've tried that you think have been effective? At our school, here's a comment from Jesse, thank you. At our school, we are going to be rolling out SOS program in the fall for incoming freshmen. That's great. Particularly good about that, um, many schools are talking about doing that with freshmen because it's a way to gauge who the students are that are coming into your school, the ones you don't know as well. Hopefully information is coming up to you from the middle schools, but these students are all new in the school. I've heard conversations in some schools about um, um, the timing on that too, because for brand new freshmen, you know, in September, or maybe early October, they may be too a little too reluctant to ask questions or engage in conversation with you. They need to know people a little better. But one of the other real advantages to doing that early in freshman year is you're giving them some information, hopefully giving them skills, but you also get a great opportunity to introduce students to who the counselors are and who the helpers are in the school. That the comments that they'll also be doing a refresher for them as seniors before they leave. Great plan. And as you know, Jesse, the SOS program uh, has just come out with a video that they call a senior uh, refresher, exactly that, which kind of goes over the point that has young people who are, they, they look to me to be young college students in the video, talking about their own experiences with depression and suicidality. Uh, it's a very powerful video. Kate's commenting here that as a counselor in grades four to seven, Facebooking and texting has yeah, he has certainly gotten into um, bullying issues. Um, the law requires you investigate it, and man, isn't that a hassle? But you're right, this stuff spills over into the school. Good thing is that students are coming to us more about this and learning how to save information. Great. She goes on. The good thing is that students. Um, oops, the curriculum that helped us besides the bullying. SOS, so they've been using SOS. Good to hear. Good to hear that that's been helpful to you. Good response from the students. Nice to hear. You know, some of the students, it's funny, some of the students tell us they find the videos and all these programs a little hokey or difficult to watch. But, you know, I think when you drill down to what the issues are, and if you're asking the students to pay attention to the issues, they get it. And they'll really engage in conversations with us and usually appreciate that. Thanks for those comments. Any other comments about what you're doing, what's helpful, what's been working? Good. All right. Well, Brandy, I, I know I'm happy to offer again. You have you folks have my email address on here and our website. Brandy, I assume you would welcome uh, requests for information or assistance at the Department of Public Health Suicide Prevention program, which actually I don't know if listeners know this, but Massachusetts, unless it's changed, my understanding is that Massachusetts spends more per capita on suicide prevention than any other state in the country, which is really a wonderful thing and I encourage everyone to continue to advocate with your legislators to continue that level of support. It's a really important function and we think we're making a difference in doing that. So thanks to the Department of Public Health for all the great work that you're doing on suicide prevention too. Thank you, Dr. Berkowitz, for that plug. Um, specifically, as we're now in um, budgetary talks with the Senate, um, they're going through, um, now they're going to conference. Um, so if any of you on the call think, you know, suicide prevention is important, as Larry said, you know, we definitely recommend that you contact your legislatures on this important issue that we continue to receive funding. And that being said, if there are no more questions, I will now end by first thanking our three presenters, Dr. Larry Berkowitz at Riverside Community Care, Rachel Corbett, and Cabria Lindsay that are seniors at City on a Hill Public Charter School. As I said earlier, I will be emailing information to all participants in today's webinar. I will also be providing a link to the podcast as this webinar was recorded. In addition, be on the lookout for any emails about upcoming webinars and trainings being sponsored by the Department of Public Health. 
As Larry did mention, we recently had our 10th annual suicide prevention conference. We had over 30 workshops, and we have that annually. So if any of you are interested in being on the mailing list for that, please just shoot me an email, and I'll be sure to put you on that list. Um, after you log off, please take a few moments to complete the evaluation. Um, I hope that today you gain more knowledge about adolescent suicide prevention and postvention responses that educators and school staff can use to better support youth in crisis and promote mental health within a school environment. Again, thank you all for participating. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Please stand by.